Well, I was born in Kansas, in Wichita, Kansas. And uh, I, of course, I went to school there. And I, I mean, that was, that was just my whole history. Hello, and welcome to Obehi Podcast. I'm your host, Obehi Ewanfo. And I strongly believe that everyone has a story to share. Now, let's get started with this episode. I moved to Michigan after I graduated from undergraduate school. I went to Wichita State University and got a degree in music ed. From there, I ended up teaching fourth grade in Pontiac, Michigan. In fact, uh, it was in Pontiac where Bukeka was born. And uh, so, and I, and I taught school there for six years. Then I, and then the movement came along and I was more interested in the movement than I was in teaching. So <clears throat> I ended up uh, being an activist for a few years while I was teaching. Then I went to, from there I went, work, went to work for the Michigan Civil Rights Commission where I, I did that for several years before I decided to go back to graduate school. And I went to graduate school at Stanford and <clears throat> did, and, and from there, I <clears throat> ended up teaching. My first job uh, as a professor was at Wayne State University. I taught at Wayne State for, for uh, well, I, after, I, after graduate school, after I going, going to graduate school, as, as I said, I taught at Wayne State University for, uh, what, 14 years. Then I went to work at Central Michigan University, uh, which is in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. I did that for, oh, I don't know. Uh, well, for, excuse me. I, I taught at... Uh, at um, Wayne stayed for 14 years, then I went to work at Central Michigan University. So that's that was my professional career, so to speak. And from there, I, I was active as a, as a sociologist. I was also active, and not just a professor, but I was active in in, in the, what continued to be the movement. So that that's really my 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 earlier history, my career history. And I retired from Central Michigan University in 2006. Thank you so much for that, sir. I appreciate that. Uh, like I said before, if I, in Africa, it is said that um, the elders are library, that they have had experience. When they talk from their experience, they talk from a wealth of knowledge that we should never by any, by any means underestimate. Because we have never lived in their world. So mm -hmm. it is important that we continue to treasure them for the experiences that they have lived. So I'm going to take some time to understand you as you were growing up. Tell me, what kind of United States did you grow up in as an adolescent? That's a great question. Let me tell you. I grew, as I said, I grew up in Kansas. And for, for people who don't know the United States, uh, Kansas uh is was not in the south but all the united states practiced segregation in one way or another um uh, up until the 60s and so i did that so i, I <clears throat> so but kansas was different because kansas did not have rigid segregation and uh and so it was sort of mixed like i my grandmother lived in the south in arkansas and so I would go visit her every summer. So I got to see segregation firsthand in Arkansas, uh, where the, it was really, I mean, it was, I mean, it was just uh, a different world. Kansas, on the other hand, was sort of mixed, sort of a mixed bag. It wasn't the South where they practiced rigid segregation, but on the other hand, the rules of, of racial uh, Discrimination was nationwide, and that included Kansas. So I did that. By, so growing up in Kansas, 
I experienced going to school with, they were not segregated schools. Well, let, let me correct that. The schools I went to were segregated from the kindergarten through the eighth grade. From the ninth grade on, they were not segregated. So I went to school with uh, whites in junior high as well as in, the, in high school. And <laughs> as a result of that, I was, I, was in a many or, I was in a number of organizations that were not segregated. Like I was in the drum and bugle corps. I was also in the band and the orchestra. So many of my experiences were, were on a desegregated basis. Um, so that, that was sort of it. And, and the fact that I went to school with whites was different than a lot of my fellow classmates who uh, black classmates in, in the neighborhood because very few organizations in school <coughs> were, were, uh, were integrated really. I mean, blacks didn't participate in, in the or organizations like band and orchestra and things like that. I was also in the drama club. So my, my experience was not one that was rigid, where there was rigid segregation. On the other hand, all over Kansas, all over Kansas, including the high school, it was, there was no, make no mistake about it that, 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 that it, it was segregation. So when I graduated from <clears throat> um, from high school, I went to Wichita State University, which was really, I mean, it was it was integrated. I mean, I went to I was in the band the orchestra. So I participated in those, in those organizations on a non-segregated basis. But Kansas was kind of strange because there were, there were rules where people sort of knew that you were supposed to be irrigated. On the other hand, there was no signs colored, et cetera, and this kind of thing. There was no rigid segregation as it had been more generally. So that went, and after graduating from undergraduate school, that's when I, uh, I started teaching in Pontiac, Michigan. And I did that for several years before I, I went to work for the Civil Rights Commission. All right, thank you so much for that there, Robert. Uh, now you talk of segregation, and I can guarantee you that there are some people who do not understand what that means. So you live in the period that you are referring to as segregation in the school and in the society. Right. What do you want that to mean for children that are listening to you now? Right. Well, uh, the the reputation of South Africa when you talk about apartheid, that's sort of what living in America was like at that time. Segre there were se se uh, institutions for blacks, institutions for whites, and that was that was it. So that's what I mean by segregation is that. It, there were restrictions. If you were black, uh, there were restrictions on what you could do. And uh, so there was no freedom, no no integrated, no uh, organizations that were not, where there was not rigid uh, separation between whites and blacks. So that, so that's what, that's, so that's sort of what I mean by segregation in that sense. Mm -hmm. All right, now during this period now, okay, we understand a lot about uh, what has happened in South Africa, the apartheid regime and the rest of it. And of course, what happened in the United States uh, in the period that you are referring to as segregation now. Uh, but for us as African diaspora, it is important that we understand how the people manage to organize themselves because again, this is going to be repeated a number of times in other parts of the West, whether you are looking at the United States or you're looking at the UK or looking at uh, France, or looking at Canada, even now, um, okay, things have changed, but there is still um, there is still a semblance of that segregational situation in many parts of the West in relation to African diaspora. So for us, it is important that we understand how those who before us have organized themselves. So I'm interested in how the people organize themselves in this period of segregation. And I believe I'm going to ask you something related to that. Uh, but please help me understand. In that period, uh, the society of the United States haven't yet evolved to the point 
that they could see everybody to be equal. They have a kind of understanding of what it means to be a human being. But the Europeans at this point haven't yet evolved enough to understand how to live with other people. So they believe that you should live in your square, I live in my square. But today, 2023, we believe that we are more civilized so we can all live together uh, uh, sort of in a, the same society. But now, I want you to help me understand, at that time, how did you organize yourself? Would the society have told you that you are different from the rest of the people? Right. Well, it, it began in the most profound way in the schools. As I said earlier, uh, I went to uh, I went to schools who were uh, black schools uh, until I was in the ninth grade. In ninth grade, I went to school with whites. But what, but what, in a sense, what we mean by segregation is the institutions were all separate. Like there, <clears throat> churches were uh, there were black churches, there were white churches, there were black schools, there were white schools. And the, the institutions were separated uh, along racial lines in that sense. And uh, it was, and a lot of that was by law until Brown versus Board of Education, which was a Supreme Court decision in 1954 that ruled that separate but equal, which had been the policy. Uh, I mean, things were separate, but they were not equal. But that was the policy, that was the name of the policy. And so under Brown, when the Supreme Court in 1954 ruled that segregation or that separate but equal was not equal and therefore it was unconstitutional. So beginning in 1954, the institutions, what was happening in the schools and the Brown versus the Board of Education. So yeah. anyway, when, when Brown was passed in 54, then segregation supposedly became illegal, even though it took another 12 or 13 years for it to become a reality. There were lots of struggles. I mean, black people uh, opposed the segregation. And as a result of that, uh, that, that became what we call the civil rights movement in which uh, we protested uh, being excluded from uh, institutions in, in the United States. And that was all over. And, and, and when I say institutions, I mean, all of the organizations of the society was based upon this, <clears throat> this separate, supposedly separate but equal. Now that's what, uh, the, that's what the, the, the law was. And they called it separate but equal. That is to say that blacks and whites were separate, but they supposedly had equal, equal uh, at opportunity, but that was not true. But what Brown ruled in that 54 decision was that separate by definition was unequal. So that that's how the society was organized during that time. And as I, as I was saying, um, blacks were just excluded from everything. And uh, but after the struggles of the protest of the civil rights movement, those barriers fell. And black blacks began to get um, opportunities in, in all areas. And that's sort of what happened in terms of my being able to go to college, et cetera, that kind of thing was, <laughs> it opened up after that. It would try to look at that story the game in that now the society is set up to be unjust. So people are given privilege to be able to pursue what is their aspiration in life. Right. Some other are just tied the rope on their neck and they are told to compete. It is not just a society as it were. So it, it doesn't become a rocket science now as to why there is a, a disproportionate representation of the people that are found in prison in the United States. Uh, because now you have, be, you have been cheating me all along. You have put me in the certain situation where you can continue to exploit me. I should never cry. I should never complain. I should just right. take it the way it is. But this is not fair. And if I cry out, you are going to set your machine again to fight me and to keep me 
in the it's a really complex situation, at least from the way we see it, we that are not inside the United States. Right. Uh, but I think it's really complex as it is. I don't know if that is how it's appeared to you too. Yes. 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 I mean, the opportunity were, were, were just not there. They, blacks were excluded from doing anything. However, now, uh, I like, for example, in terms of TV personalities, uh, blacks are, have opportunities to, 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 to play various roles in society and on TV and movies and things like that. Blacks get an opportunity to participate, whereas they couldn't before. No, I was just saying that in the exclusion was pretty uh, universal. I mean, there were places you couldn't eat, et cetera, that kind of thing. I mean, so when we say separate but equal, uh, that was that was just the way that the society was organized. It wasn't until voting rights were uh, were permitted that things really began began to change because then then uh, blacks could vote as a result of being able to vote. They could change policies, so that's what happened. But it was that was that as a result of protest that get, made that change. All right, that, that protest. I wanted to tell me a bit about it because at a point you became part of the civil rights movement. I wanted you to let me know if there is anything at a point that actually um, encouraged you or forced you to join this movement. How was the movement at the time? Well, it it, it began by just. Uh, by, as I said, by protesting, uh, I'm sorry, let me move that. It began by people actually taking to the streets and protesting the, 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 the rules. And I, I think they got tired of, of us disrupting things. And they began to, to, little by little, change it. Then later on, it got to the point, I would say, Late the late sixties, like sixty five, was the passing of the Voting Rights Act, which gave blacks the right to vote in the South, and uh, and as a result of that, they began to get black people elected to to positions, and so the rules began to change. The protests changed the rules. That's what that, in a sense that's what happened. The the protests were disrupting the status quo. We disrupted the fact that we were being excluded. And by protesting, by those protests, it, it exposed the, the inequality and exposed the dis discrimination as it was. And be because of that, they began to think that they were like hypocrites, particularly with the United States be, be, supposedly being the uh, the the nation where there was the most freedom and the most democracy, and so by, but the protest exposed the fact that, that there was no democracy and there was no equal opportunity, and so that's what the what the protest did was actually expose the lie, is is as what it was. Do you remember any particular incident uh, or any particular situation that you have participated in that may have, um, uh, uh, I don't know, changed your life or imparted people or changed any particular situation, a particular event or a, joint, a day of a protest that you want to single out for examination? One of the, for example, uh, there, the, the, the bowling alley that was the most popular in Pontiac in 62, 63, uh, was the 300 bowl. And now blacks could bowl, because they could bowl on certain nights. And so we would begin to, to protest the fact that we were being restricted to certain nights. And, it, and we did this by actually pro, by demonstrating that we were being excluded. And by demonstrating that we were being excluded, they began to, to, to change the rules to open things up. And so, like, for example, uh, bowling leagues. Uh, whites could, could bowl uh, anytime. 
uh, five, six nights a, a week. But blacks were restricted to certain nights. And as a result of that, the, 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 they began to um, re do away with those restrictions and such that blacks could have leagues that could vote any night. That was the thing. And for example, um, eating. There were blacks could not eat in certain restaurants. And so there was that kind of exclusion. But as a result of the protests, they began to allow blacks to vote, uh, to eat, dine anytime. So that those were some of the things. But it, it, but that was, as I, as I said earlier, it was so universal in terms of how those rules were. And it, it applied to all things at all times. And so that those were the exclusion. What would be your final thoughts here? What would be your final message here to conclude this today's episode? Okay. Well, I just want to say that I think the one thing is that but historically, uh, blacks have had to fight for opportunities in 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 the society because uh, the natural the the history has been one of of uh, exclusion, and so that's that's the uh, that that's been the history. You know, Obek, Bay, I would like one of the things I'd like to do is send you a copy of. Uh, of an autobiographical piece I did about, oh, it was 30 years ago, but it, it explains much of my early, early life. My childhood is where, where my early uh, professional life. So I'd like to send that to you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the, the conversation. I really do. For the, okay. for the constraint of time, that is where we're, we're going to end it today. Thank you so much, uh, sir. All right. All right. Thanks. Wish I could have been more lucid, but anyway, th thanks for having me. It's, it's a pleasure. We're going to talk again next time. Okay, look forward to it. If you enjoyed this podcast, make sure you subscribe so you never miss any of our future episodes. Rate and review Obehead podcast and share with your friends who might need it. I remain Obehead everyone for. Thank you so much for listening. I'll talk to you in the next episode.